Hey everyone, I'm Melissa from Knitting the Stash, and this is episode 70 in the series. Uh, I'm coming to you from Urbana, Illinois, where I'm a professor at the university there, and it's a lovely, quiet Sunday afternoon, uh, a little bit of snow after all the rain, it's been a wacky weekend, uh, and it's been an even wackier week, so I might tell you guys a little bit about that. <laughs> For those of you who are new, this is a cast about knitting, DIY, garment design, modification, with a little bit of spinning thrown in there from time to time. Um, and for those of you who are coming back, it's so lovely to see you. And I've heard from many of you who are coming back and many of you who have just found this podcast for the first time. So welcome to all of you. It's nice to spend some time with you. Um, what, let's see, where can you find me? That's usually a question I get. I'm knitting the stash just about everywhere on YouTube, Ravelry, um, Instagram, uh, and the blog, which is knittingthestash.wordpress.com. And that is where I post all the show notes for this uh, cast. So if you're interested in any of the patterns or the links, or any of the things I talk about. I try to put all that information over there for you to find if you're interested. Uh, what am I wearing? I'm wearing my alias sweater by Isabel Kramer. Uh, I knit two of these <laughs> because I love them so much. And as some of you know, my other version, uh, which I knit in Isle Yarn uh, DK uh, weight yarn, was the button band was eaten by the dogs. So I'm re-knitting that as we speak. Uh, but this version is one that's very near and dear to my heart and I've worn it pretty much every day all winter long for the last couple of years. Um, this is some local to me Shetland wool that I acquired um, in a crazy Craigslist Starbucks kind of like yarn swap at one point. Uh, and I dyed it myself with acid dyes into this beautiful kind of eggplant color knit up another alias and I, I used a yarn a contrasting kind of soft softer um, sock yarn for the inner collar and it is like my go-to sweater. I love this sweater. I love the alias design and I love Isabel Kramer's work so I'm very happy to be wearing my alias by Isabel Kramer. Uh, so what do I have on the actual cast today? I have a lot of stuff. I have um, a finished object which is a hat. I have my Rosenblum Yenser sweater which is not finished it's still missing a sleeve, um, but we're going to talk about this sweater uh, and talk about increasing and decreasing in pattern, which should be an interesting segment, I hope, for you guys. Last week um, we talked about button bands and that seemed to get a lot of um, interest from you guys, so we'll do another technical kind of segment in here. Uh, and I have a little info about the Shorn 2019 Farm to Skein yarn launch, which is happening at the end of January. We'll talk about that. And giveaway winners, a uh, new giveaway for this episode, and a couple of shout outs for some wonderful folks out in the community who are doing cool work. Um, let's see. So maybe I'll tell you a little bit about what's been happening though for the last week in case you're interested before we jump into some knitting. Um, I'm about to go on a ski trip. Uh, chaperone a high school ski trip. Some of you know I did this last year, uh, so I think I know what I'm getting into, but uh, this year I'm going it alone, and uh, we were hoping Spencer was going to come with me and we were going to kind of chaperone a condo together, but we've had a little bit of a tragic uh, week this last week. Um, as some of you know, Tink, she's, she's doing fine now, but she had quite an injury um, happen uh, last Thursday. She ran outside in the dark, as she and, and her sister Millie usually do, and ran through some bushes, which is usually fine. Um, and one of the bushes just happened to have a little nub of a twig sticking out. And I think what happened is the two of them tried to get through a narrow area, and one of them bumped, you know, like Millie bumped into Tink a little. And Tink took that stick to the back, and all I can say is it's an injury that I've never... I've never seen an injury like that on a human or a dog, and we raced her, Spencer raced her over to the emergency room, the emergency vet on campus, and they took her right in and, and took good, great, excellent, wonderful care of her. I stayed home with Millie, kind of like, because we had, it was dinner time, we had food out everywhere, Millie was not inside, it was just craziness, and we didn't know what had happened at that point. We thought, I thought there were like coyotes in the yard, I was like, how did this happen? I mean, it was a huge injury. Um, so, we've been dealing with that for the last week. Um, been a very intensive doggy hospital around here. Um, and Tink hasn't really been left alone. She doesn't want to be alone. She's um, been in a lot of in discomfort and we've been just trying to help her be as comfortable as possible and keep Millie away from her and keep them happy. Uh, the good news is she's sewn up. She is, uh, she's been on tons of antibiotics and pain meds and she went, finally got to go back to her regular vet um, who did another sewing up. 
Uh, and so she is resting very comfortably, and actually she's in the room with me right here. Um, she's been laying in her... She's had these little t-shirts on to kind of keep her stitches safe and everything, and she's laying right here on the rug with me. So she's doing okay, for those of you who are worried, um, and saw the pictures on Instagram. But we're a little, we're a little stressed out. <laughs> and so that's why I said it's nice that it's a quiet Sunday. Um, but so Spencer's not going on the ski trip with me. I'm still going because I agreed to chaperone. So I'm, I'm off to ski land. I'm hoping to take a sweater project and a sock project with me on the bus ride, do a little skiing, cook a little food for the girls and make it back home. Fingers crossed. Uh, and then uh, the other, the sweater and the socks are actually for Zach because my 15 year old actually texted me last week and just said, hey mom, could you knit me a pair of socks? And my mom heart just went like, grew like 15 sizes that day, right? I was like, yes, I can knit you socks. So I'm gonna knit him some socks. Um, I said, what are your favorite colors right now? And he said, gray and white. And he wants just a kind of plain pair of socks. So I found the um, Country Socks by Nancy Bush. And these are in the Folk Socks book, uh, which I picked up. I've admired this book for a long time, but I finally had a reason to pick it up. So I'm gonna knit up these um, kind of simple hiking country socks for him. I got the yarn. Um, and then when uh, he came over this weekend, he said, hey mom, you can knit me a sweater too, right? And I was just like, okay, my heart grew 15 more sizes. So I have the perfect sweater um, picked out for him and I'll talk about it on a future episode. Um, but it's a kind of really cool, uh, doodly looking sweatshirt that's a top down kind of cowl neck with a drawstring and kind of some graphic difference in the dark yarn and the light yarn. And I think he'll like it, he approved it. So that's what I'm gonna kind of work on, I think on the bus trip out to Colorado. So that's our lives, <laughs> in case you guys are interested. It's been quite a week. Uh, everyone is healing, everyone is starting to kind of wind down and relax a little bit, so that's all a good thing. And with that said, I think we'll jump right into the rest of the knitting, the finished objects, the uh, works in progress, and uh, all the giveaways and shout outs and things. All right. So let's jump right in with a finished object. This is the Miki hat by uh, Layla Raven, and it is a Quince and Company uh, pattern. Uh, and Quince and Company sent this pattern out uh, at the end of, right around the new year, um, for those who are subscribed to their newsletter. So I happen to be subscribed to their newsletter, which is a great thing to do. Subscribe to the newsletters of, of designers and companies that you like, because sometimes they send nice little discount codes or free patterns or fun stuff like that. So it's worth it if you don't mind having your email clogged just a little bit. Uh, so this pattern came out and I just thought it was kind of cute and I finished it in about a day and a half or two days at the end of 2019. Uh, and I just went stash diving for it. So the pattern calls for Quince and Company yarn, uh, but I went with some knit picks that I had in my stash. Um, and this is their worsted weight. Most of these colors are in their heathered. Um, I think it's like Peruvian Highland wool, the heathered colorways. I had a bunch of them left over. Um, so I just kind of went for it. And as you can tell, um, some of the colors blend into each other a little bit more than you might like for color work. So I do have a brown down here. There is a purple mixed in among the gray. And then there's this beautiful garnet kind of red foxy color that I used um, for the fourth color. Um, and a lot of people will tell you with color work that it's important to lay out your skeins next to each other and take a photo and then turn it into a black and white. And if in black and white you see each of the colors, um, like the difference between them, uh, then there'll be enough contrast for you to do a color work pattern and have that contrast between the colors. Not everyone wants to do that and not every color work pattern or feral knit you would, would be perfect that way you know sometimes there's some variation and difference and that's good um, and in this hat I kind of wanted it to blend a little bit I didn't want like I like the contrast of the gray and the the brown and the other colors but if you took a black and white photo of this hat you wouldn't see any other contrasts. like you can't really pick out the fact that there's a little bit of purple in here and even the red and the brown they kind of blend a little bit together in a black and white photo um, but I kind of like the way that they look all put together in this hat, so I just kind of went for it. Um, it does take four colors. I think you could do it in two. You could probably do it in 
a single color if you really wanted to, but you'd lose a lot of the cool contrast. Um, so let me show you what it looks like on a human head. I knit the larger size because I made it um, thinking of Spencer because I'm always knitting him extra hats because he's always, he's a little hard on his knitwear and he'll use it up um, under a bus or doing some kind of work. But So it's a little bit big for my head, um, but I think you can get a sense of the, the fit and the style of the hat. It's meant to be a kind of beanie that, um, you know, it's not too slouchy or anything like that. Um, and one thing I did modification queen in the house. Uh, I didn't like the decreases for the crown in the pattern. Um, I'm a, I'm a big stickler for crown decreases that work the right way. Um, I don't particularly like hats where the decreases happen really quickly and then you end up with like this kind of either a point or with this kind of like gather where you can see the gathers and they don't lay flat. I don't know why it bothers me, but it just bothers me. And the decreases on this hat were tending that way. I finished it off the way that it, it um, said to in the pattern. I didn't quite like it. So I just modified the pattern to do a slower rate of decrease so that this version of the hat in this worsted weight knit picks yarn would sit nice and flat and kind of show off that foxy color at the top. So if you're interested in making the hat and maybe you got the free pattern too and maybe you want to knit it out of knit picks and maybe you want a flatter crown, um, I put the modifications on my project page so you can go check that out um, and see what I did. I basically introduced an extra knit row um, in between my decreases and I decreased um, less, fewer stitches for each decrease row so that I ended up with that nice kind of round but flat crown shaping at the top, which I quite like. Um, I wasn't worried about a lot of things with this hat though. I wasn't worried about the color jog. This is where the round meets the round. Uh, I just, you know, I knew it was a fun quick knit and I wasn't too worried about it. There are ways to fix that. Um, color jog, tons of great YouTube videos out there about it. I didn't bother with it this time, um, but if you wanted to, there's tons of advice out there on YouTube. So this is the Miki hat. Quick knit, really fun, warm, and I think Spencer is going to throw it into his stash of knitwear and use it up <laughs> for what it's worth. Um, okay, onward to more knitting, which is the Rosenblum Yenser, which is for our Knits in Translation Cal. And you guys know that, <laughs> so many of you know this, I have been working on this sweater for way longer than I usually work on sweaters. Usually they take me two, maybe three weeks, depending on how complicated they are. Uh, but this one, I've basically knit it twice because I had inverted the colors, it's in translation, I was trying to figure out what to do, I hadn't lined up my center the right way in the top body. Anyway, there's been so much going on with it that sometimes all the little things <laughs> can get lost. Um, but I'm happy to say the body is finished as of last time, last cast, and I finished a sleeve now. And the cool thing about these sleeves is they are knit from the bottom up, and they are a set-in sleeve, so I did all the seaming work, which I think you can see here, just to see if my um, decreases would work. I pretty much used the pattern a little bit, but made up a lot of what I thought might happen with the sleeve from the picture <laughs> in the pattern. Um, so doing things like um, the pattern itself didn't say how large to make this, nor did it say how many stitches you'd want to cast off in the end because often sleeve caps at the top will have uh, a certain, uh, probably about two inches of stitches at least, um, that are kind of bound off here at the top. Um, and that's that kind of classic sleeve cap top that you see. They're kind of shaped like a bell curve, in, but with a little extra flare. Um, so often at this top part, there's about two inches of stitches that you've cast off. Well, the pattern doesn't say how many to cast off. It just tells you initially how many to cast off for the underarm. It tells you a little bit about how many to decrease in that first inch of decreases for your sleeve cap. And then it tells you toward the top, you know, do the same kind of decrease again and then bind off all the stitches. So I was like, okay, I gotta do the math. I did the math. Turned out my math wasn't right either. Um, so what I ended up doing is looking at the picture and counting, looking for something that was dis distinctive about it. And so this uh, sweater, I'll bring it in here so you can see, has this great um, continuation of the color work in these textured faux cable stitches and in the knits and pearls here, right? Um, and in the picture, I could count how many of these happen 
up to the join on the sleeve, and so I did. And that ended up actually being producing the right height for my sleeve cap. So I think I ended up with 11 of these. Yeah, I think it was 11. Um, and then I decided to put the sleeve cap, to install the sleeve cap, to see if it actually worked before knitting the next sleeve, because these are actually the third and fourth sleeves that I've knit for this sweater. <laughs> I wanted to get it right for once. Uh, so it worked, um, and the sleeve set in very nicely. I think you can see here that um, there's hardly any puckering. Um, it just sits kind of nicely. I have very wide shoulders and my mannequin doesn't, so that's why you see a little bit of a hang here. Um, but what I wanted to talk about with this sleeve, aside from the set-in part, which was a complicated thing to kind of learn and figure out, and I'll, I'll try to spend either another podcast segment on that or maybe even put up a separate video about knitting sleeve caps because it's, there are some tips and tricks out there that are hard to accumulate unless you've read around and tried to find them all. But what I wanted to talk about here is increasing in pattern and how I have both succeeded and failed, which I think is an important thing to talk about. So. With this sleeve, um, all the directions that you're given uh, once you um, you know get to this point on the the cuff is that you're going to increase in pattern every two inches or every two centimeters. And so for me, I I did about I had to redo the math on that too because I'm not using the same yarn they were in the pattern. Um, so I did my increases as you can see here, every sixth row, and I put a little pin in to mark where those um, increases were happening so that I'd remember where they were for the next sleeve when I went to do them. Um, so that's what these little markers are for. And then I increased in pattern, and I think it was very successful down here, right? I kind of, this pattern, um, as you can see, it runs one of these guys, the kind of like flower work, and then one of these guys, and then the flower work. So <clears throat> down here, I start off with flower, uh, like let's call it a trellis, flower, trellis, flower. And so to increase, I thought, all right, once I increase on either side of these stitches, I'll eventually create enough stitches for this, for it to add another trellis first, because that only takes three additional stitches. Um, so I added my trellis in over here, and that's a, that creates a nice triangle look to the pattern, I think. Um, and then up here, what I was waiting for was enough stitches on this side of the increase to be able to add another flower in. And that's both, it's not right and wrong or good or bad, but it's the way I chose to do it because increasing in pattern to me is a really difficult thing because I'm a very visual person and for me to increase in pattern, um, more successfully, what I would have had to do to have done is to lay out and ch chart the entire pattern um, for uh, what it would look like when it when I'm at the top here, when I have all my stitches, all 78 stitches that I needed at the top, and then kind of work down and and I would have had to kind of chart it ahead of time for myself because I can't I'm just not very good at visualizing like oh I have an extra stitch and then I can add this part of the pattern in. Spencer is very good at that, and he was the one who actually tried to walk me through how this might go. Um, so my choice as a knitter, because I'm, I didn't want to chart it all out, and I thought to myself, this is the underarm, um, it's going to be less visible, and I'm just not as worried about it. Um, my choice was to add the extra V, leave some open space, and then go for the flower here. And you can see that it's not totally successful. It just doesn't, it doesn't work as a as a sleeve because you have all this open space here and then all this open space here. And I think a lot of good um, fair owl knitters with more experience at increasing a pattern would have added in partial pa parts of this pattern so that um, as the increases are happening here, you would end up with half of a rose, a quarter of a rose, you know, a couple of dots down here to kind of like continue the visual version of like seeing the white and the purple stitches going up. Um, and I also think you probably would um, add in another trellis in here at some point, or you'd do some kind of like inner uh, star work or something to kind of just visually give, give your eye something to go to rather than just this kind of dead purple space. So in the future, this is what I've learned, um, that I think a more successful increase in pattern 
would be to kind of chop up this pattern a little bit and not wait for the full amount of stitches that I needed, those 13 stitches to create a full pattern. I'd go for something like um, maybe divide it into quarters and say, okay, well, I'm, once I have four stitches, I'll put in this part of the pattern. Once I have six stitches, I'll put in this part of the pattern. Once I have 13, it'll be the full pattern. Um, and that's just something that takes time and experience and or, and or willingness to chart it ahead of time. Um, and as I've kind of noted to myself about this learning experience, um, I think it's also important to think about where in your garment this is, these increases are happening and whether or not it's kind of hidden. So for me, all of that that I just showed you so visu visibly, it's not visible when you're actually wearing the sweater, neither in the front nor in the back, because actually the extra little um, bit that I did do here, it kind of, in a flash, it kind of looks like it's an increase part of the pattern um, and that it's meant to be that way. So I'm not as concerned about it for the sweater and after having re-knit the sweater <laughs> twice over, um, I wasn't going to go back through and try to redo it one more time and make it that much more perfect. Um, and I think that's okay too, as a knitter, to kind of like recognize that you, if you're okay with a little bit of imperfection as you're learning towards something, um, it, it's, I think that's absolutely fine. And for me, this is a nice reminder of like what co color work increases in pattern can look like if you're just trying it for the first time. Um, it's kind of like saving your first skein of yarn when you're learning to spin. It's a nice marker for me to go back to, you know, years from now when I've knit many more color work sweaters and I have a better sense of how to increase in pattern effectively to look back and say, oh, okay, I see what I was trying to do and you know, it works, but it's not perfect. And I think that's okay. So um, there are plenty of resources out there for increasing in pattern um, and I will put them over in the show notes for this episode. Um, Uni Knits has a nice uh, tutorial. Yusolda Teague has a cool tutorial. Um, Miriam Felton has an interesting tutorial about how to uh, expand your chart, like I was saying, and then use post-it notes to kind of block out the parts that you don't need until you need them so that you can see what happens as the pattern grows. Um, and I will say that a lot of those tutorials, they're working on a simpler uh, color work pattern than this. If you had a simple kind of like uh, just a, an offset dot kind of pattern, that's a little bit easier to increase. And I've worked on sweaters like that, like the Lee Lanao um, sweater that was, it's all over color work, but it's a very simple pattern. That was actually fairly easy to increase or decrease in pattern. Same with the by Olive Knits. I can't think of the name of it right now, but it has these little bees all over it that are textured stitches and you just figure out kind of where to place them. And those patterns are a little easier because None of the individual stitches that you're placing, either their little bees or the dots, are dependent on other dots. <laughs> you can kind of like place one and then fudge the next row and place another one because you're just looking at something that's something that's small like this. If you just had a whole sweater that was made up of these, it would be much easier to increase in pattern. But once you introduce kind of larger motifs, smaller motifs, some dots running along, and then you're trying to increase and decrease in pattern, I think that's when it gets to be the point where you need a chart and you need those post-it notes and you need to think about it. Um, but the Isolde Teague and the Uni Knits um, tutorials talk a little bit about textured uh, work, so like things like lace and cables, and I find those more intuitively easier to increase or decrease in pattern and to kind of fudge and adjust than I do with color work, which is really kind of funny. But I would love to hear any of your advice for increasing and decreasing in color work. I'm gonna open up a Ravelry thread so we can talk about it um, because clearly it's something I wanna learn more about and I'd love to know from you guys who have been knitting longer um, and more color work uh, knitting than I've done, um, how you go about increasing or decreasing in pattern with color work and what are some of the strategies that you have. So please post over there, let us know so that we can all learn together and make our color work that much better. All right, um, what else have I got for you today? I've got um, a little note about the Shorn yarn launch that's coming up. So as many of you know, um, I've been working with uh, local um, shepherdesses around here uh, in Illinois to gather up fleece and try to mill um, a yarn that's as local to the Midwest as possible. So last time around, um, I had uh, fiber from Fox Run Farm in Monticello and uh, fiber from Kathy's Seven Sisters Farm 
uh, here in Sydney, Illinois, and I had it milled up in Michigan at Stonehenge Fiber Mill, and we did the Cormo Shorn launch of 2018, and that was awesome, and I thank you all so much for your support. Um, and we're doing Shorn 2019, which is a beautiful um, Coriadale Teas Water blend and it's in a gray this year and I am going to do a big reveal for that yarn um, and its patterns which have been designed uh, by Kefren Pritchett. That's going to happen at the end of January so mark your calendars for January 31st we're going to do a shorn yarn launch video and that's when the yarn will become available. I have a big tub of it right now we've been working on as some of you know a test knit for Kefren's patterns so it's going to be pretty exciting once I can launch that yarn into the world. And if you want to get your hands on some of it, it will be available at the end of January. So farm to skein yarn from Illinois to you. <laughs> and some beautiful patterns from Kefren Pritchett. All right. What else have I got here? Uh, I've got giveaway winners. I've got a new giveaway. And I've got some shout outs and some life stuff to kind of round out the podcast. So uh, the giveaway that we've uh, had going on was from Lorna Lancaster of the Cocoon Tree and you guys were pretty darn excited about this giveaway and I can see why because these bags are beautiful um, and if you're interested um, in if you see something that you like here and you want to go check out um, Lorna's shop she's over on Etsy as the Cocoon Tree and I'll put a link here I will put a link over in the show notes so that you can go check out her work um, Lorna is a beautiful um, designer and maker who has been sewing since she was about six or seven years old uh, and she makes beautiful project bags and this is from a series that she actually um, debuted over at the uh, Edinburgh Yarn Festival uh, with Ginger Twist Studios so we're really lucky to have a set of these to give away um, and as I mentioned last time this was one prize was the mini notions bag and a kind of medium sized project bag they're beautifully finished lined uh, zipper top bags that have a kind of contrast lining in them uh, and so that was set number one then there's the triangle bag which is a really cool design especially for something like sock knitting and it's just a beautiful flat-bottomed yarn bowl. So I've got three winners, and you've all been notified. Uh, so I'm just going to announce your names here. Winner number one is Sue, who is Ramfastos on Ravelry. And winner number two is Jessica uh, Gascoigne, who uh, put an entry in on YouTube. And winner number three is Jill Jackson. And again, she was on YouTube. So congratulations to Sue and Jessica and Jill for winning these beautiful bag prizes. Um, I will get them in the post to you as soon as I hear from you. Um, send me an email with your postal info and I will get all of these fabulous prizes out to you in the mail. Thanks for participating and thanks so much to Lorna Lancaster of the Cocoon Tree for sending a full set of these beautiful bags and the yarn bowl. Um, I have a couple of her bags in reserve, so if you are part of the Cal for Knits in Translation, there'll be a prize over there, and I think we might use the other prize for something else. We'll have to figure that out. So uh, there's still more to be won from Lorna of the Cocoon Tree. Okay, on to the giveaway for this episode. Uh, this giveaway is sponsored by Georgia Camden, who is an illustrator and a graphic artist, and she got in touch with me... Um, maybe about a month ago, um, and I actually know her mom through the podcast, uh, Louise of uh, Knitting Poppy. Uh, many of you know her as well and follow her on, on Instagram. So Georgia is a wonderful illustrator, and she has offered a copy of this beautiful print, uh, which is, I think you can see it in the light, it's a woman who's knitting up, um, it looks like some, some greenery, some leaves, into a really beautiful blanket. And this was actually the cover of a, a crafting magazine and uh, she sent along a copy of the print so that you guys could maybe hang this up in your own yarn room which is what I'll be doing. I'm gonna um, get this framed and up on the wall uh, and what I'd like you guys to do if you want to win this beautiful print from Georgia Camden uh, head over to her uh, little shop her little website and uh, let me know by leaving a comment here 
on the blog, on the Ravelry thread as usual. Let me know which of her designs you like the best. And I just want to show a couple of them to highlight them because I spent a little time over on her um, website looking at her prints and I think she just does some absolutely gorgeous work. So she has illustrations, little prints like this. She does cards. She does um, uh, work for uh, folks who want to have their own illustrations done. I just love some of her line drawings. I think they're gorgeous. I think she has a really great eye for thinking about figure and motion and emotion. And I just fell in love with so many of her um, sweet designs. I, I have a real thing for, and maybe it's because of Wind in the Willows, but you know, adorable creatures, uh, just they do something for me. So head on over to Georgia Camden's website. Uh, let me know which um, print or illustration or what catches your eye over there. I just love to know. Um, and you will be entered to win this gorgeous print from Georgia Camden. And I will open this giveaway um, worldwide. Uh, and as usual, um, international uh, winners, I'd ask them to pay shipping, but you're more than welcome to enter. And we'll do a drawing in a couple of weeks, so by random number. So good luck. And I hope you enjoy checking out Georgia's um, website and all of her beautiful illustrations. And thank you, Georgia, for this lovely uh, gift that you sent and for um, sponsoring a giveaway on the podcast. Much appreciated. So that's your giveaway stuff. And I just have um, a couple of shout outs that I want to give um, to some other folks in this community who have been working um, and making and doing in the last um, little bit here that I've taken note of. So one is uh, the good folks at Indigo Dragonfly who are trying to put together a more size inclusive chart, um, sizing chart for um, garment knitters and garment designers. So if you uh, are interested in getting involved in that crowdsource campaign, I, I will put a link in the show notes so that you can head over there. But basically what they're trying to do is gather actual measurements from actual women and people out there in the world um, so that uh, the sweater designers of the world will have access to a sizing chart um, that takes into account the reality of measurements, not just some kind of standardized measurements that may or may not correspond to anyone's actual body. So if you want to participate in the Indigo Dragonfly uh, crowdsourcing campaign to gather actual measurements of actual people in the world, head on over there and give them your digits. Uh, the other um, shout out I wanted to give was to Cami Noise, who was one of the first um, farmers who uh, agreed to an interview with me over on the blog so long ago. Uh, and Cami is a wonderful shepherdess out in Montana. Um, and she is uh, very intrepid. She's doing a lot of work. She has sponsored the Copper K Fiber Festival for the last couple of years and gotten that off the ground. She's just a wonderful woman. And she actually has a brand new pattern out um, that was designed by Tracy St. John called the Copper Leaf um, Sweater. And it is um, a beautiful colorwork uh, design that you can go check out on Ravelry. I'll put a link here and a link over in the show notes if you're interested. And the sweater is designed using her yarn from her farm that she's raised, and I think that's just amazing. So huge shout out to Cami, who was a wonderful interviewee back in the day, uh, and she sponsored a few giveaways on this cast, and I love the look of the new sweater, which is a raglan pullover, beautiful color work, and the colors for her yarns are just gorgeous. So go check out the copper leaf pattern by Tracy St. John um, that was designed for Cami Noise. Um, yeah, so it's fun to shout out, uh, give some shout outs to the community. If you have stuff that you'd like um, to get the word out about, please let me know um, and I'd be happy to spread the word uh, to this wonderful community that's so supportive of so many of us doing interesting work. So I think that's about it for today's episode. I wish you all well and a happy 2020 and I will see you in a couple of weeks. Take care.